Right. Okay. So you can tell we've been out of practice for a couple of weeks over our August break. So again, apologies for the late starts, everyone. I think everything has been sorted now. So I would like to thank you for joining us today, despite the lovely weather outside. So as with um, as Live with Scientists team, we're pleased to resume our events. So before moving on to today's live session, I would like to give you all a quick update on our program until April next year. So some of you may remember that we had done a poll back in April asking for your preference on subjects to cover. Our volunteers used that information uh, on and dedicate, um, used that information to identify each month's theme. So you have selected, I think, nine months or 10 themes. And starting from this month, we will be dedicating each month uh, onto those teams. Uh, on the onto those themes. So what we're going to do is that each month we're going to release a block, a Q&A session, a live session and a hands-on activity that you can do at home. And at the start of each month, we will be circulating a trailer, just um, telling you about what to expect from that month and what kind of activities you should be seeing with us. And I'm sure you've seen the examples of that throughout uh, this month. So uh, the format of our talks haven't changed at all. So we're going to start with a discussion session for um, live Q&A and a presentation for the live session. And then this will be followed with a 10 minutes break and a Q&A session afterwards. So please feel free during our discussion to submit your questions to the social media accounts or to the YouTube section as you always used to do. So Dave, thanks very much for sparing your time to join us today. And I look, me. yeah, I look forward to our discussion though. And uh, before I actually start with harder questions, would you like to tell us about uh, yourself and your research focus? Uh, yeah, so I'm currently a lecturer in the School of Biological Sciences in um, <clears throat> Manchester, and I'm I lecture on uh, evolution and, and genetics. Uh, my original uh, interest was in zoology. I went off to university to to study zoology. Um, but then I kind of discovered computational biology and the evolutionary aspects that, that come about from studying the genome. So I, after my undergraduate degree, I came back to Manchester uh, to do a one year's master's degree in, in bioinformatics, which is the, how we use computational tools to look at large biological data sets. And then I've kind of moved around uh, looking at different evolutionary problems in different systems over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I went down to Birmingham to to study sex chromosome evolution, um, uh, and that's really interesting. And we, I, I did a lot of sequencing of DNA and trying to work out for the first time how uh, mammalian sex chromosomes are evolving, but also whether that can those same patterns are seen in in other organisms. And then I went to Germany, studied uh, cichlid evolution. So uh, cichlids are these tropical fish that you get in. Uh, lots of places around the world, but particularly in, in the, the Great Lakes of Africa. And they're amazing and very interesting because they have this, what we call an explosive radiation. That means that there are thousands of species that have all come into existence in a, in a very small area, small, small geographical area. Uh, and there's lots of in, interesting evolutionary theories as to why, why that's happened. Uh, so I spent a couple of years studying those uh, and then for lots of different reasons, including starting a family, uh, we moved back to the UK and I did some work on uh, fruit flies. So I worked in a Drosophila lab um, uh, and we looked at uh, mating strategies in, in fruit flies and why uh, females change their behavior before and after mating. Uh, I worked in Tracy Chapman's lab in, in Norwich doing that. It was a very fun sort of year and a half there. And then um, I got an opportunity to come back to Manchester uh, and study. Um, by this point, I'd mostly been working on, on DNA and DNA differences between species. Um, but uh, a guy called Casey Bergman invited me to come back to Manchester, where we started looking at not differences in the DNA between species, but in differences in the way genes are, are turned on and used in different species. And for a couple of years, I did that. And it was a really good uh, experience to study the differences across lots of Drosophila species where we could do lots of experiments and make lots of measurements. Um, and then 
about six, seven years ago, I got a chance to uh, work on human uh, expression differences. So a guy called Neil Hanley, who's, who's still at Manchester, uh, he recruited me to try and look at uh, genome wide across the genome to look at uh, how differences between organs come about. Because we have one, ge one genome, but we're able to make hundreds of different types of cells. Um, and that's what I've mostly been doing with a few other projects on the side um, for most of the last sort of 10 years. Great, thanks very much for that uh, nice introduction though. You, obviously you've been around quite a lot and you have done, you have ex, you know, accumulated lots of uh, good experiences and memories, I bet. So um, as you know, at the start of the month, we had a blog from um, um, Elke and uh, she actually explained a bit about the gene and the genome. But in layman's terms, could you please remind us about what these terminology mean? Uh, yes, um, probably the genome is an easier one to tackle first. Um, it's a newer term and, and it's probably a little bit more precise, or at least less disagreement about what it means. So your genome is the entirety of your, your DNA in one of your cells, essentially. So uh, it's all of the DNA that's on all of your chromosomes. So in humans, we have uh, 22 pairs of autosomes and then two sex chromosomes. So making 46 chromosomes in total. Um, we only have that, that one genome is, is kind of in two parts. You get one, you inherit one set of chromosomes from your mother and one set of chromosomes from your father. And in, in humans, it's about, it adds up to about 3 billion bases on each pair. So about 6 billion bases of DNA. And every time one of your cells divides, it makes an entire almost perfect copy of all of your DNA, packages it up and sends it onto both of the the, the daughter cells that come out from that cell division. So the genome is kind of reasonably well defined. And for about 20 years, we've kind of had a, a model of a, the human genome because we completed the, the human genome project back in the very early 2000s. Um, and researchers around the world can, can look at the, the genome and compare um, the sequences with the reference with other individuals. Uh, a gene is, so is, is a much more commonly used word, but it's not something that, that uh, means exactly the same thing to, to different people. So I think originally when Mendel was um, doing his experiments in the 19th century and looking at, at the, the phenotypes of peas, whether they were wrinkly peas or smooth peas or whether different flowers produce different um, colors, he was kind of creating the idea of a gene. The fact that there were these sort of ideas, these um, particles inside the cells which conferred these attributes and they could be inherited in, in fixed patterns. So the original sort of genetic idea of what a gene is, is a sort of abstract concept about um, things which can be inherited. Since we've had the ability to look at DNA uh, and then later on sequence the genome, people have gone into the genome and tried to say, well, where is the gene in the genome? And we've had to come up with kind of new definitions as to the limits of a gene. So the kind of classic textbook definition is that um, something which uh, is processed from DNA into RNA. So DNA is the, is the basic material that your chromosomes or the, your genetic material is made from. To use that DNA, you have to uh, transcribe it. So we transcribe DNA into RNA, uh, which is typically single stranded. And then in many cases, you'll see that that RNA is, is, is translated into a protein. So all the proteins that we're made of, um, like hemoglobin, uh, albumin, these kind of things, they're all encoded by a gene in your genome. And to get there, you need to kind of read the DNA, turn it into RNA, export it out of the nucleus, and then, and then make it into a protein. Okay. Um, Great. So, um, so this is uh, quite nice. So you have mentioned about a couple of things in there. So you've mentioned about the genes, the organization of the genes and etc. So can you tell us a bit more about why do you think throughout evolution, our cells, our bodies have felt a need to actually evolve into genes? And I also want to ask another question straight after this. So why do you think 
we have got this, we've got the gene regions where we know they are actually producing a product like RNA or protein. And we've got regions which do not code anything, which is called either junk DNA region or non-coding DNA regions. Why do you think our bodies have actually evolved to have these regions? So why did you, uh, the first question is kind of why do genes exist as, as functional units? Yeah. Uh, is a good question. I think that's basically a, a kind of uh, Lego bricks kind of reasoning that it's easier to make something out of out of existing components and repeating those components than it is to try and build something all in one go. Um, it's not not a way I often think about. It's not a question I often that th think about really because we kind of take it for granted that there are these particle particles of inheritance. Um, but what we see time and again in evolutionary biology, well, even in making of one organism, is that um, different parts of your body reuse the same machinery. So we have to be kind of discrete um, blocks and things that you can make. So for example, um, how to make a cell wall. This is something that all cells need to do. So they will have certain proteins that contribute to that. But there are hundreds of types of cells in the body and many of them will have little variations on that, that format. So they'll have slightly different compositions of their cell wall, okay? So they'll have more or less of this protein or more or less of that protein. And a good example of that are, are, are probably immune cells where many different types of immune cells express a different set of proteins on their cell surface, okay? And by doing that sort of combinatorics of different building blocks, uh, you can create very many, many more patterns than you could by just having one system that always does the same thing. I guess it's a bit like the difference with bacteria, where in, ba in some uh, bacteria you have an operon, so you have lots of lots of genes which are all controlled by the same promoter. They're all turned on together or turned off together, okay? In, in more complex organisms, we don't have that same structure in that all the genes around the genome are kind of regulated, maybe not independently, but as, as discrete units. Um, and this relationship between uh, uh, the DNA and the RNA makes a protein is kind of um, the result of of natural selection operating on the protein level mm. to try and control that. But yeah, why, why it has to be designed, uh, organized in a certain size, I don't know if there's a particular one answer to that. Okay. Um, you had another question as well, which was about um, non-coding elements in the genome. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we're really interested in. So um, we've known for a long time that, that not all um, genes are making proteins. We've known that a lot, of the, a lot of the genome is making RNA, but that RNA is not translated into proteins. Um, we also knew for, known for a long time that the, the genome is big and it's far bigger than it, than it really needs to be uh, to make the number of proteins that we think we've got. So when the, when the Human Genome Project was being uh, set up, people were uh, guessing how many genes we'd find in the genome and most of the guesses were of the order of 100,000 different genes or even higher. And then as time came, as the data came in, as time went by, the number of genes went down and down and down until we'd kind of settled on roughly 20,000 proteins with a number of non-coding RNAs. And we don't know exactly what that number is yet because we know that a lot of the genome is being turned into RNA, but it's not being used. The other thing we found out is that there are parts of the genome which are um, evolutionary conserved, so they're the same in different organisms, but they don't seem to make any products. And uh, these are quite revelations. So, so one of the good things about the the, Hurley, the human genome project, one of the ways it was it was useful the first time was that um, it allowed us to compare one genome with another. But of course, first of all, we only had the human genome and the fruit fly genome. And then we had the mouse genome. And one of the, the next genomes to be sequenced was the fugu yeah. genome, the puffer fish. And you might wonder why, why did they sequence the puffer fish next? Um, and the reason was twofold. One is, is it's quite far from human and mouse, but not so far as to be completely different. So it's a vertebrate, it has a head and liver and, and heart, many of the things that we have, 
Um, so we could use that to look to see which parts of the genome were shared. The other reason why the Fugu genome was chosen was because it's very, very small. It's mm. roughly about, maybe not quite a tenth, but much, much smaller than the human genome. Uh, yeah. So it was cheap. So uh, they sequenced the, the Fugu genome and then aligned both of the human, the mouse and the Fugu genome together. And if we looked across that, we looked at all the genes that we knew about up to that point, we already knew the sequences of some of the genes. We could see that most of the genes were conserved between human and mouse and the Fugu bush fish. But we also saw at that point that the in between the genes were little blocks of DNA which were identical between yeah. human and mouse and pufferfish. And they didn't fit any patterns that we had of um, being genes or, or genes which encode for proteins. And these turned out to be uh, regulatory elements, parts of the genome which were controlling the expression of, of nearby genes. Yeah. So they're required for genes to be used to make proteins, but they themselves don't help, they don't contribute to the sequence of the protein and the, and the, the structure. Right. Okay, all right. So um, thanks for that detailed explanation. So as they are not contributing this uh, coding regions, do you think we can actually call them as junk DNA? Uh, no, not, not, not as good. So, so this term junk DNA is, is is quite often used, and, and I think is it Sidney Brenner or somebody who who kind of uh, who said it, and he said that like, junk DNA is, is DNA which is just sitting around doing nothing, like junk in, in my garage, but it could instantly be turned into into garbage, rubbish DNA, and then you throw it away, right? And that's why like, if you go in our garage, we've got a load of junk which isn't doing anything. That's different to what to the to the regulatory elements I was just talking about. Regulatory elements are absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So you cannot grow an embryo or a human being or or a, a zebrafish or a mouse without those regula regulatory elements. They're really really important. They're as important as the genes themselves. Okay. So if you if we know from experiments in mice, uh, more importantly experiments in zebrafish and Drosophila, that if you if you break those regulatory elements by by mutating them. Uh, it can destroy a part of an organism or, or it can stop development altogether. They're really, really crucial. The problem with them is um, they're very hard to find. So we can find them if, if, if they're conserved between species. But even if we can find them, we can't tell what they do. Um, certainly not in humans. We have to do quite a lot of experiments in model organisms to work out what they do. And unlike genes, they're not always in the same place. So I've said that we found them in, in pufferfish, right? Those are the ones that are conserved. Those are the ones that are doing the same job. But we've got good reason to believe that there are other ones out there in the genome somewhere that are doing something, but we don't know where they are. Um, okay. So one of the things we've been doing is trying to look at early embryos and, and try and work out, are there any signals there on the, on the DNA of, of what, um, what might look like an active piece of DNA rather than something which really is potentially junk. So, so I, I'm not saying that there's no junk in the genome. Our genome is made up of probably about 40% of stuff which doesn't help us in any way. It doesn't contribute to how we look uh, in any way that we can measure. Um, but, and it's quite difficult to tell the difference between what looks like junk when you look at one sample versus what might be a key regulatory part of your genome. Okay. Okay. So what what do you think is the evolutionarily you know advantage of these non-coding DNA regions that are helping us to regulate gene function? Because as far as I'm aware, we have got regulators next to you know a lot more in a lot more close proximity to our genes than this distant um, regulatory regions. So why do you think our DNA has e evolved in such a way? What is the advantage of that when it comes to survival? I don't know, <laughs> is, the, is, the, is the short answer to that one. Um, there are certainly some patterns we've observed. So there are certain kinds of genes which have uh, more of these conserved regulatory elements and more of them 
further away. Okay, so uh, one of the strange patterns of the genome is that the distribution of genes in the genome is not random. So they're not, they're not evenly spaced. So they're not, there's not an A gene every 100,000 bases, nucleotides. And there's not uh, a perfectly random set of, of genes. Genes occur, they're overclumped in some places where you've got lots mm -hmm. of genes in, in, in one area. And then you've got other parts of the genome which are really empty of genes. Uh, and, and not in, and more so than you'd expect by random chance. Now, some kinds of genes are more often associated with, with more intergenic space around them. Mm -hmm. And those, those genes tend to be key genes involved in development. So determining where you make a heart or how you make a heart or where you grow a brain or where you grow your limbs, those genes tend to have more take up more genomic space. Mm -hmm. Even though the, the, the proteins that they make on average are, are, are no bigger and quite often are smaller, um, the, the space they take up in the genome is, is bigger. And when people looked at these um, conserved regulatory elements that we've now, we've now sequenced um, hundreds of, of vertebrate species and, and people have done comparisons of like 50 different vertebrates and found many of these conserved Intergene, enhance. Well, we call them enhancers, okay, or candidate enhancers. Things that which can change the expression of genes. Um, they are clustered around these developmental genes. So a few, well, I say a few. I mean, two thousand of our twenty thousand genes are developmental related um, genes, which help to help the organism, the body, to decide mm -hmm. how to pattern itself, what's left and right, what's front and back, and where the organs go. Um, and so, so yeah, the, but what, what was the, what was the focus of the question originally? It was kind of like, what's the ev evolutionary advantage of having these? Yeah. 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 So the, the, the main thing, the main purpose for them is tissue and organ specificity. So if you have, uh, if you're a single celled organism, you have one genome and you have kind of one uh phenotype and you're responding to the environment but you if the environment changes you you change your entire cell to respond to that and you do something different and then the environment changes and you change back that's what a single cell organism has to do multicellular organisms have these specialized functions in different parts of the body right i mean we're a long way from simple multicellular organisms but the way that they achieve that is by having specialization so different parts of the organism use the same genome expressed in different ways um, to, to have specialized functions. So you can still think about it for us. So we have heart cells which beat rhythmically. That's one of the things they do. You wouldn't want a liver to be doing that and excreting things rhythmically all the time. You want a liver cell which is more uh, metabolic and, and uh, breaking things down and, and releasing things as and when needed. Okay. Yeah. So but they're all using the same genome. They're just having to uh, respond to, to the signals coming in. And these enhancers, these developmental enhancers, they help control um, expression of key genes which set off whole regulatory pathways. That is, there is a kind of decision that, that happens in, a, a, in development of, of like a few cells decide to become a heart. Yeah. They then make that decision and they then store that decision for the rest of their growth and development. So as they divide through time, they store that information, that decision that I'm going to be, become a heart. Some of that decision is, is wrapped up in their epigenetic marks. So it's carried along with the DNA. Um, some of it is stored as uh, which proteins they're expressing as well. Great. Well, thanks very much for that explanation. So that actually brings me on to my next question. Okay. So we know that our genes, obviously, our gene DNA code is, you know, defining who we are and how we function as an organism. It defines our physiology. But um, we now increasingly becoming aware that there are more complex or more levels of complexity on top of that. And like you say, epigenetics is suggested as an explanation to this uh, complexity that we see. So can you describe again in layman's terms, 
what is meant by epigenetics? So again, a bit like gene, it kind of means different things in different contexts. And it's, it's a word we, we're using at the moment to group together a number of different phenomena. So if you think about multicellular organisms, we have, you start off as one cell, a zygote with one set of DNA. And from that one cell, it grow, it divides and divides and divides, and then begins to specialize and, and, and gather its own resources. It's making these regulatory decisions as it goes along. So parts of the parts of the organism are specializing. The epigenetic part is that the genetic part is that the, the, the DNA has to be transferred from at each stage, right? Each time a cell divides, it makes a this really, really good copy of its, of its own DNA and passes one copy to each of the, the, the daughter cells. But some of the proteins that are in that cell, they also get carried on. Some of the RNA gets carried through. And many of those proteins are intrinsically sort of wrapped up with the, with the DNA, okay? And part of the way that uh, cells can remember what decisions have been made in the past is because their DNA is, is packaged in different ways in different cells, or it, it, it contains different marks in different cells. And so in a, in a very broad sense, epigenetics is just all the stuff that gets carried over through cell division that isn't the genes themselves, okay? Okay. There's lots more to it than <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And I'm sure we will um, um, get to learn more details about epigenetics as our um, discussion progresses. Yeah. So, uh, so when it comes to then, so you said it's anything that you, you know, that you sort of inherit during the cell division. So can, um, other than the gene, so can you then suggest, or can you say then the epigenetics is also inherited? Yes. It, uh, but again, it can, it can be limited to a certain extent. So when we're talking about the, the development of a single organism from one uh, embryo to uh, every adult tissue in your body um, through probably 50 or 70 cell divisions. Mm -hmm. um, the epigenetics is kind of a uh, set of marks that is different for each tissue as you go along. Mm -hmm. So your heart will have a different set of epigenetic um, flags or a different epigenetic memory to your lungs and that'll be different to your brain as well. Um, and generally between any two people, those epigenetic marks will be the same and they'll be tissue specific, okay? Uh, when we talk about inheritance there, we're just talking about within one organism. And one of the reasons that epigenetics has been in the news a lot uh, recently is because people also want to ask, well, can you then pass on those changes to the next generation? And that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of where we have to be quite careful about what can be passed on and what can't. So, um, and there are some very discrete mechanisms that we know definitely exist um, called imprinting. I can talk about that as well. Um, and there are other ones we, we just don't know quite how long they can be passed on for. And some people are, are asking questions around, can we, can the things that we do during our lifetime, so if we smoke a lot, if we drink a lot, obviously they can impact our health and just being healthy and, and, and not being healthy can have an influence on our children. But can we pass on in our um, sperm and eggs, in our gametes, can we do something that damages our sperm and, and gametes or, or can there be epigenetic marks in those that we can pass on to the next generation? And that's been a focus of quite a lot of interest, um, but it's very unclear as to, to what extent that um, can continue in a, a generation after generation. So I think the... Um, I don't know if we have time, but it'd probably be worth mentioning the imprinting of, of specific loci, which happens in a sort of maternal, paternal way, if anybody's interested in hearing about that. Um, yeah, I'm sure um, we are. So um, how, do, how do these relate to epigenetics regulation of, you know, gene expression, let's say, or the proteins, you know, how does it affect our physiology then? Do you mean imprinting or do you mean... Yeah, imprinting. Yeah, so uh, imprinting is a specific kind of... Uh, epigenetic mark so um, uh, the the, um, the way the way we know about it is because we started to observe really strange uh, inheritance patterns it's been known around for quite a long time over 50 years um, 
And there, the um, whether or not a gene has an effect on your body is dependent upon whether you inherit it from your mother or your father. Okay. Um, um, it's not very common in the genome. We, we only know about 100 genes that have this, this, this um, effect. And uh, it is the case that, uh, so what happens is that your, your mother, when you're making her, her eggs, imprints some of the, um, the DNA. So the imprint is like, if you push, push your hand into something, you make, leave a mark on it. What it means in terms of DNA is that the, the DNA has got uh, a chemical modification at certain locations. The same copy of that gene, the different allele from your father, will not have the same marks. And vice versa, the parts of the paternal, the, the DNA you get from your father, will be imprinted. And almost always that the, the copy you get from your mother will not be. So this kind of absolutely mutually exclusive patterning that you get. And most of the time, uh, you can't see any effect of these, these imprinting alleles. And you may think, well, what's the point then? Why, why, why did both the mother and father do this imprinting and changing of loci if the net result is that nothing happens? Um, and the reason is because they're kind of in a, in, a, in, a, in a battle, in an arms race. And most of these imprinting genes are to do with growth of embryos um, in the womb. So that the, the, the paternal alleles are generally trying to promote faster growth and more invasive growth of the placenta to, to get more resources for the embryo. And the, the maternally imprinted alleles are trying to do the opposite. They're trying to slow things down and, and just make things go a bit slower. You only really notice these happen, this, this effect, if one of the parent alleles is missing and doesn't get expressed when it normally is. So if the mother has a gene which is um, expressed normally, and the job of that gene is to, is to combat uh, a father's allele, which is normally expressed as well and trying to um, promote growth. If the mother's allele is missing, then the father's allele kind of wins and the embryo grows too fast. And you get these kind of overgrowth syndromes and problems with, with embryos which are growing too fast. Um, so it's what's called, what we call an evolu evolutionary arms race. And that particular set of imprinting only exists in, in, in mammals because we have this internal growth where there's the ability for the, um, the father's genes to try and influence how fast that growth occurs inside the mother as well. I realized I really need to turn to open the curtains again because it's gone very dark in here. <laughs> yeah, if you would like to do that. I'm just going to open up a little bit. Yeah, sure. Oh, right, that's a little bit better, but not much. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, um, so thanks very much. Now we know a bit more about imprinting, but um, I want to, if that's all right, I want to go back to um, epigenetic changes again. So when you have got these changes in a, let's say, adult, uh, for example, someone who has got um, an X disease, but without a genetic defect, is there a possibility that this defect or this illness is being caused by these epigenetic changes? And if so, do you think every epigenetic change that causes to a disease or disorder is going to be inherited or is it actually reversible? Um, so that's, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so the first part is, can epigenetic problems cause diseases? Yes, they absolutely can. So um, if, if your epigenetic mechanism, the, the, it's kind of, if you think of it in terms of way of cells to remember who they are, their identity. So heart cells need to remember that they're heart cells and liver cells need to remember that. If that machinery breaks down, um, it can, in theory, uh, erode that memory so that you might get misexpression of the wrong kinds of genes or you may, the cells may forget. So we, um, we try and, so the, the cells are, are, are keeping an active, Mm -hmm. actively um, renewing these marks on the, on the genome. Um, if you've got a problem which is caused by those things, it's very unlikely that you would pass that on to your offspring because the, the, germ, the germ cell line 
that's the part of your body which makes eggs and sperm, is separated out from the rest of your body very early in development. Okay, and it doesn't really show itself on the surface. So uh, there has to be for an epigenetic change. So something that you've done to yourself or something that's happened to your most of your body during your lifetime for that to get into the next generation, there would have to be a mechanism for it to go back uh, and make its way into your germ cells and be passed on in your gametes. And we don't really have a mechanism, not a specific mechanism for that to happen. Okay. okay. Now it is possible, of course, if you've got a, a systemic problem that you're, you're generating gametes and eggs, which are not great, then that would be a, but that would not be a specific disease that would kind of be a general failure to develop, develop properly. Um, is that everything you asked? I can't remember if there's another Yeah, part. yeah, yeah. So uh, I was also wondering though, you know, for example, um, okay, we know that unless your one of your parents has got an epigenetic uh, problem or a, you know, a change which might cause a disease, then you're not going to uh, get it. But for example, if you had this epigenetic change in your body, um, do you see an effect of that in terms of disease or disorders straight away or does it need to accumulate over um, over time is it an immediate effect you know you get your epigenetics change and the next morning you start to have these problems no, no, no. Uh, well I, I don't know every human disease and I certainly mm. don't know every human genetic disease so I don't know if that's possible but I would say generally no because it's a slow it's generally a slow thing um if you were to turn off the epigenetic systems, most of your cells, I think, would probably kind of coast along fine, doing the same thing that they're doing. Um, it's, but they, if, if they don't renew their epigenetic marks, then you can have problems. And some of the key ones are silencing effects. So, so DNA methylation generally, not always, but generally is used by cells to turn off genes that it, it never wants to use again. Mm. Um, and if those genes happen to be uh, genes which promote uh, cell cycle prolifer proliferation, so making more cells, and you allow them to get turned back on again inappropriately at the wrong time, then mm -hmm. a tissue which was sort of uh, complete and finished and adult and doing what it's supposed to be doing might suddenly kind of regress to a younger stage and then start to inappropriately make more cells and that's one route it's not the only route it's one route to get towards cancer and mm -hmm. uncontrolled uncontrolled cell growth um but generally no i don't yeah it's kind of difficult with it with with, with epigenetic marks to say i don't i don't know if there's a, a particular disease that just pops into existence like that um okay all right, great. So I made you to talk for 40 minutes. I think it's time okay. to give you a break for 10 minutes. So we will resume at 20 past seven for our q and session, if that's all right with you. That's great. Thank you very much. Lovely. See you, everyone, um, after the break. I hope you had a chance to uh, have a rest a little bit. I mostly went to check if the uh, children were not burning the house down. That's fine. <laughs> well, uh, from your calmness, I gather everything is uh, okay. Nothing is burnt down. No, it's fine. It's fine. Great, great. So we did have some questions from the audience. So I would like to start with those first, if that's okay with you. Yep, fine. Great. So um, somebody was asking, um, what is the role of epigenetics in aging? Yeah, so um, it's a good question as to whether, uh, so there's two aspects of what people mean by aging. Aging as in uh, normal developmental growth to, to adulthood, and then aging as in the aging process of, of kind of, Speaking of somebody who's over 40, uh, this kind of slight deterioration and, and then uh, deterioration in quality of our bodies over time. The first part is, 
is kind of the thing that I was talking about earlier, that the, the normal growth and development, this memory of all your cells of, of having to make a decision and then keep, stick with that decision. I'm going to be a heart, I'm going to be a lung and keeping it there. Um, so it's absolutely crucial for that. And it, it seems to be part of its function, if it, as much as it has a function. The second part, as in, if you're thinking about, oh, why am I growing old? Is it my epigenetics, which has gone mm. haywire? Is it, is it causing me to age? Um, possibly, but it's difficult. And it's one of those things that, that kind of can go wrong if, if it's kind of, you take the brakes off. Um, but it's, it's not a very specific thing and it's not a programmed thing that's meant to happen at a particular time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, as I said earlier, like loss of loss of the right epigenetic marks can non-specifically kind of lead to other problems and, and open the door. It's a bit like if in a city you kind of randomly started turning the, the traffic lights to green, uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to predict what was going to happen, but some bad things would happen. Okay, um, it's not uh, as bad uh, potentially as as DNA based mutations that can unlock other genes because they're then inherited. So if you have a, uh, the start of a cancer and you have a, a, a DNA based change that's automatically inherited by all the, all the following uh, cells. The, the same, what would be called an epigenetic mutation can occur and it can release a cell. Um, yeah, I don't know what, what, what the prevalence of that is. I don't know how common that is as a mechanism in terms of all the t- different types of cancer you can get. Um, but yeah, okay. and I think uh, maybe the aging of tissues is is it's a tricky one. That so aging is a kind of a, a trade off between maintaining youth and, and and being able to keep renewing tissues <coughs> versus uh, fighting off too much growth and 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 keeping keeping your cells locked into what they're meant to be. So epigenetics is one of those mechanisms where you kind of you flick a switch and cells then go, okay, I've decided what I am now. I'm not going to stay that way. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, there is a follow-up question as well um, for um, this, which you sort of uh, touched, but I would like to ask it uh, anyway. So does the effect of epigenetics uh, stop us from having, you know, eternal lives, you know, living forever? I, I don't know the answer to this one as well. So can we live forever? I think not, probably um uh it, it's a question i've asked before and i don't know the answer to whether whether we're programmed to die at a certain stage no matter what it seems that when we you know, all these health advances if we actually cure all types of cancer then 10 15 years later we'll all die of heart disease or something else will there'll be all of our systems do kind of start to degrade and some people are very lucky and they, they live a long time and some people are less lucky and they get caught by two two or three of these things earlier on um, if one, the, I think the reason that people are asking that question about epigenetics is because uh, if it's possible to, in a carefully controlled way, roll back time in, in some cells and try and uh, reverse these changes, then that's why I think some people are kind of excited about that. Um, and in in a in a in a stem in a, a cell in a laboratory, it's possible to. Uh, this is how we get some of our stem cells that we use in, in the in the laboratory for testing is take a piece of skin cell that you can get from without killing somebody uh, just to get a, a skin cell, roll it back to a, an earlier stage, and then you can ask it to, to differentiate into a different um, uh, cell type. And that's, that's really useful for us as, as biologists studying types of cells and if we want to get those cells in a dish and we can experiment on them and, and try and model the processes in living systems as they grow and develop that's great one possible aspect of, of doing that is, is kind of some sort of stem cell therapy where we can take those cells and grow take one of your older cells take it back grow a replacement tissue and put it back in um, and epigenetics can have a role in that so if we, if we reverse some of those marks but uh, I don't think in most cases we understand the system well enough to, to be able to do the whole thing. Um, I think there are, there are some limited cases where we can, we can take stem cells and, and renew them a little bit, 
and then put them back into 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 donors but uh yeah aging okay. the whole thing of aging we're not there yet i don't think we can immortalize people entirely not yet at least uh, If you if you know the way answer to that, if you know that, that actually I'm wrong and it's been fixed in Manchester, then 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 let me know. But uh, I, I, as far as I know, it hasn't yet. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks okay. very much. Uh, so um, so um, the other question from the audience is that: Are there any therapies targeted at reinstating epigenetic flaws that may develop during disease? Um, I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I should have brushed up on epigenetic diseases a bit more. Um, specific epigenetic diseases, no, I don't know. I think that in theory that's possible. And, and it's kind of similar to what we were just talking about in that um, you can uh, artificially manipulate some of these epigenetic marks. Um, so in theory, yes, you could, but I don't know of anybody who's doing that in people uh, yet at the moment. Okay. okay. And um, the follow up question from this one after this one is what's the latest on epigenetics and plur pluripotent stem cells? That's quite a big field as well. So, so the, uh, and again, very, these are very related. I think there's kind of a, a theme uh, of these questions. So uh, generally we, we're, we're using pluripotent, so pluripotent stem cells are um, cells which have been taken usually from a differentiated, so a, a, an adult cell uh, taken into the lab and um, convinced to, to sort of regress into a more uh, stem earlier embryonic form. And then we use them to, uh, in some cases, we can't make every type of cell in the lab, but we can, we can push them towards making a heart cell or making a liver cell or a pancreas. Um, and that's useful for, for studying drugs. One of the ways we can, uh, one of the ways we measure whether they are becoming a heart cell or a liver or a pancreas cell is to look for the expression of key genes. Okay, so we, we have, they have a signature of, of so if I'm making um, albumin, I'm probably a liver cell, or if I'm making particular types of um, myosin, I make them a heart cell. The same can be said of the epigenetic mark. So they do tend to respond and they do tend to replicate um, earlier, um, earlier developmental stage points. So uh, yes, they, they can, they, we, we, um, the epigenetic marks do tend to correlate with the, with the change in gene expression when we, we make pluripotent stem cells. Um, but uh, and the, the, one, of the, one of the ways that we're going to use those in the future is to hopefully um, find cell replacement therapies. So one thing we want to do um, is to create a uh, replacement islet cells. So if you know the, the people with type 1 diabetes usually born without or deficient in a making um, uh, beta cells to make insulin. Um, and it's proven very, very difficult to uh, make uh, workable beta cells in, in the dish. But that's one thing we're, we're kind of trying to work together by finding out the set of um, proteins that need to be reactivated to, to make those um, cells make insulin um, and to try and see if, if, that's, if insulin alone is, is sufficient or whether we need to activate a whole range of genes to, to stabilize that um, cell type. Great, thank you. So um, again, we've got another um, question from the audience. So the audience is asking, are there any epigenetic laboratory tests available? I'm assuming they're asking if there are any diagnostic tests that you can actually apply uh, for someone that potentially has the disease, but with no known uh, genetic defect. So if so, hmm. Do people do we do we look for epigenetic changes um, if we've already exhausted gen genetics as a as a possibility? Um, yes, in a kind of gross scale, in terms of looking across the whole genome um, under a microscope. I I don't know if we look for 
epigenetic panels, there are ways to do that. So we can, we can survey the genome um, for epigenetic marks. Um, and there the are different techniques to look, depending on whether you want to look across the whole genome, which we, we wouldn't do typically for epigenetic marks because the genome is big and our possible places to look at are, are, are very small. Um, but you could look at a targeted panel of the genome and try and see if there are um, unusual marks. Um, but I, I don't know how frequent that, how common that is. I think it's possible, but not very um, commonly used. Um, okay. Normally the sort of state of the art at the moment is just still looking at, at, at gene sequences. Um, and, and you might've heard about the 100,000 genomes project, mm. um, which is one of the bigger projects in the world where we sequence close to 100,000 people, including some from, from around Manchester. And there uh, we're still finding variants of you know, DNA-based changes, and that tends to be associated with developmental disorders, so people who are kind of grow, born um, with some kind of uh, problem. Even then, it's quite tricky to find what the causal variant is, what's causing it. Um, and we keep hitting this problem of um, the genome is big, and we're trying to find the parts of the genome which are, are involved in particular tissue development and hopefully as a way to understand particular diseases. Okay, so as well as, you know, for, um, for example, um, at the moment, if we have got a well-defined disease that's associated to a genetic defect, um, based on what it is, there might be some genetic tests available. So from Absolutely. what you're saying, I gather that there isn't an equivalent for epigenetic changes. I don't, I don't think so at the moment, no. Um, okay. Do you see it uh, happening in future then? It, it could do. It, it would have to, we'd have to characterise exactly what those, those changes were. So um, I have said there, there are no sort of general case, cases for diseases. There are, of course, um, defects of imprinting. Uh, so we talked about earlier about imprinting, which are well known, um, and they can be they tend to look for deletions of the genes themselves where they come up. But the other big area where imprinting has an effect is in X chromosome um, silencing as well. So if, that's just, if that wasn't working properly, you'd have a, a dosage effect and you'd have some kind of uh, X-linked problem that um, would, would, would show up with, with too many, um, too much expressed from the, from the X chromosome. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think this is all the questions that we had from the audience, but I have a question myself. Um, I'm really fascinated and intrigued with your latest paper that you have published in um, Nature Communications. So in there, uh, as far as I understand you, we're talking about, you were reporting about the epigenetic changes that are occurring during organ development when we are in, um, in you know, growing up in our mother's womb. So um, can you tell us a bit more about that study? What was the most significant thing that you found there? For example, what was the method that you have actually used to identify these epigenetic changes? And how do you see this being applied to developmental uh, problems or preventing those developmental problems? Yep, yeah, sure. Um, so this was quite a, uh, it's published this year, but it kind of started about nine years ago when I first met with Neil Hanley and we were talking about um, the developing embryo and how we could apply new um, techniques for sequencing the genome um, to look at uh, how this this one problem the central problem is uh, all these cells have one genome and they they re, uh, divide and make lots of different cell types and make all these decisions and then remember okay so how does the genome do that and what part does epigenetics play in the in, in storing those decisions um, he Neil was originally interested in in pancreas and, and liver development but while we were looking at the embryos we thought we should probably look uh, as many different tissues as we could, partly so that we could use the material um, to its fullest extent, but also because we already knew from work in mice and Drosophila that part of what makes a, um, a particular organ have its identity is not just the, the genes which are, are turned on and are being used and expressed,
but also the genes which are, which are turned off as well. So some, some of these key developmental genes have to be kept very quiet so they don't not miss inappropriately expressed. So you don't want to express, start expressing heart genes in the middle of your brain because that would disrupt the function of your brain um, and, and vice versa. So there are quite strong regulatory um, systems uh, to try and damp down inappropriate expression. And that is recorded in, in the genome uh, using these epigenetic marks. So what we thought we would do is uh, look at different tissues and try and find which genes were being turned on and off. The real advantage of this, and the, 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 one of the biggest findings, there was a several, several really good things that came out in the paper. One of the really key things is that these marks also show, show up on these intergenic regions that we talked about earlier. These things which are not in themselves genes, but they help to control gene expression they also get marked by these epigenetic marks. So that means that we can, um, if we survey the entire genome using this, these techniques, um, we can find not only which genes are being turned on, we can find out which genes are being actively turned off, they're being damped down. And we did thankfully find quite a large number of places in the genome that were had good signs that, 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 that were what we call enhancers. So they're involved in gene expression. Uh, and the reason why that's really useful at the moment is because with projects like the 100,000 Genome Project, where we're sequencing lots of people's genomes, getting lots of information back, but not knowing exactly what it means. If, if so let me just explain how the 100,000 Genome Project works. Typically, they, they sequence a family, so they'll sequence parents and a, and a child, and they'll compare the parents with the child and, and look, make a list of all the mutations that or the variations that the child has that the parents don't have. And that's their kind of long list of possible explanations as to why this person's development has gone off the rails a little bit. And the problem is that list is quite often quite long. The genome is big, so you end up looking at hundreds of places in the genome and wondering, is this the variant? Is this the variant? Is this the variant? So what our data set does is it reduces that search space, not entirely, you know, we're not, we haven't solved everything, but what we've done is we've said, well, this bit of the genome during organ development is really active. And if it happens that that piece of the genome overlaps with, it, with a variant that we find in somebody, then that's a little bit more evidence. So when the doctors are trying to uh, establish risk and, and work out an explanation for a, a genetic um, problem that's come up through development, our epigenetic marks can help decode that and, and, and decipher that. Um, there were some nice examples that came out as well. So um, we had one example where we had some collaborators in Cambridge who'd been looking at uh, developmental disorders of the brain, particularly. Um, and we found one uh, G to T trans, trans um, translation from uh, sorry transversion uh, in the in the genome of one boy who'd been brought fought with a born with a developmental disorder of the brain. In our data set, we find that that intergenic piece of DNA, so it's not it's not part of a, a known gene, is marked as being active in brain but not in any other tissue. Okay. So that's that's like good evidence. We think that, okay, the people in Cambridge thought it might be this one, and we said, well, we look at our data set; it's active in our data set. That's just another step towards getting towards the solution. It doesn't solve it; it doesn't it doesn't provide a cure, but it does help us understand and find the variants that are um, potentially causal, and that just basically helps us search a lot more efficiently in the future. Um, the reason that's useful in the future yeah. is, is if you're a family and you, you get these variants, like when you think about BRCA and, and familial breast cancer, deciding between which variants in your genome cause breast cancer or link to it and which ones are not is quite important because people have to make then decisions about, um, you know, what do I tell my family and what information do we give? You just tell people, oh, I've got some variants which cause cancer people who are related to you will think well have i got them as well 
um, and sharing that information is, is, is quite important. And the more we know about which parts of the genome do what, then the better able we'll be at um, working out risks um, of, you know, if you're going to have a child, what's the chance of you passing on this variant um, to them? Okay, yeah. great, great. Thanks very much. So obviously you are um, finding a lot of an extra level of information which actually is telling people whether or not that mutation or that variant is going to be significant yeah. in the disease that they're talking about or the organ, you know, is it going to affect the organ that they're talking about? That's great, really. It's it's very good thing to know, though, because, you know, sometimes, let's say, a decade ago, they would do a blood test, and from that test, they would decide whether or not you have the mutation, and your decision would be based on whether you carry that mutation or not, even if it's something to do with maybe brain. At least nowadays, we can just maybe be able to say that, yes, it's a mutation, but it might or might not cause a problem based on your epigenetic signature. I think it's it's about uh, increasing the resolution. So yes, I mean even some of the tests that ten years ago were very good. Like so, so some conditions are still very much like that, like cystic fibrosis. We know quite well most of the common variants that mm. cause that disease. But for many diseases, we don't yet know what what causes it, um, and or we might have it sort of pinned down to a certain region, but we don't know exactly how that works. Um, mm -hmm. So it's most of the benefit is kind of like reducing the search space for people to look at these novel um, variants that come up in, in genome projects and have a look um, and help. But they can also help us to understand how development works as well. So for me, with my sort of evolutionary background, it was very interesting for me to see parts of the genome which people knew nothing about before suddenly lit up um, and, and showing activity in tissue specific ways and so I could you know look at a particular heart gene and say well there's the gene it looks like it's active in heart but look at all this other stuff around the genome that's that's active in heart as well associated with that and, uh, so it's very interesting for me as well. That's great that's great thanks very much so before closing today's session then um, obviously we have we might have some um, younger people actually watching this um, session as well so what would uh, your advice be to them if they are planning to uh, get involved in your field after their studies so I think my, my field is kind of general genetics sort of thing I would I would read um, read look out some good books uh, Matthew Cobb who you you spoke to earlier he's written a really good book on the history of, of DNA that's good um, on epigenetics, there aren't so many uh, books that I've seen in these popular science that would be good for young readers. Um, Nessa Carey wrote one called The Epigenetics Revolution, which covers a lot of the interesting and perhaps a bit more of the sensational aspects of epigenetics. Um, but generally, just read and follow your interests and don't let anybody tell you it's, it's kind of boring. Just keep going. Uh, and and uh, it's kind of what you need to do is get really delving deeply um and try and follow find some interesting authors who will hopefully point you to other interesting authors and, and then you can you know sometimes you can follow scientists on twitter but that's not really always easy to get into um unless you know the field already so read and you know hopefully aim towards getting a degree in genetics or something that would be a good start lovely great thanks very much for your time so i just would like to let our audience know that our genetics uh, and evolution theme is going to continue with uh, dr miriam smith next week and dave thanks very much for your time it's much appreciated you're welcome we will let you um, spend the rest of the evening with your children yeah i will do thank you very much lovely thanks a lot